everyone. I'm Damon Wilson. I'm Executive Vice President here at the Atlantic Council, and it's my pleasure to welcome our three distinguished speakers today, uh, French Ambassador Gérard Arreau, German Ambassador Peter Wittig, and British Ambassador Sir Peter Westmacott. Thank you very much for being with us. It's an honor to host each of you uh, and to host all of you together at the same time for a conversation on Europe and the Iran nuclear deal. I'd also like to welcome all of you in the room, as well as those that are following us online through the, the live stream, as well as the TV broadcast. We want to encourage everyone to join the conversation uh, using the hashtag on Twitter, hashtag ACIran. The Atlantic Council in its South Asia Center launched our Iran Task Force in 2010 uh, to provide insight into the complex, is complex issues related to Iran and to explore all possibilities for peaceful solutions. The task force has produced groundbreaking work on the Iranian nuclear program, the intelligence related to the program, the impact of sanctions, Iran's regional role, internal politics. The task force has published on these issues more than a dozen, dozen issue briefs and reports and held more than 50 public and private briefings. In 2013, the task force released a series of recommendations for U.S.-Iran policy that foreshadowed the current path of negotiations, which we'll be discussing today. We are now entering, of course, what could be the final stages of nuclear negotiations with Iran. Negotiators from the United States, Britain, France, Germany, Russia, China, the P5 plus one, and Iran are meeting in Vienna to piece together the details of an agreement that will place long-term curbs on Iran's nuclear program in return for nuclear-related sanctions relief. The negotiations, particularly the joint efforts of the P5 plus one and the E3 here today, showcase the critical role of the transatlantic partnership in addressing the most prominent global challenges. So we're especially delighted today to be joined by the ambassadors from the E3 nations, France, Germany, and the United Kingdom, to discuss this Herculean diplomatic effort, which in large part began with the efforts and persistence of their nations over a decade ago. I'd now like to invite up uh, Barbara Slavin, a senior fellow uh, who leads our Iran task force work here, to introduce each of our and she has largely guided all of the work on Iran here at the Council and be, can be credited for bringing together uh, this discussion today. So let me invite Barbara and our guests to the stage, please. Damon, thank you very much, and thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, I'm delighted everybody has returned from the holiday uh, with an interest in this subject. We've been trying here at the Atlantic Council to uh, bring the three E3 ambassadors here for some time, because I think their role and the role of their countries has not been uh, properly recognized in the Iran negotiations. It's fair to say that the E3 invented Iran nuclear diplomacy back in 2003. Uh, the U.S. administration at the time, the George uh, W. Bush administration, had a policy of no uh, acknowledged diplomatic contacts with Iran. There were some, but they were secret and they were not uh, substantive. And so it was Britain, France, and Germany that took it upon themselves to try to deal with the issue of Iran's nuclear program uh, after uh, various facilities were uh, revealed in 2002. And uh, just a quick note before I turn over to our ex excellent speakers and, uh, and introduce them. Um, the Bush administration policy toward Iran at the time and toward the nuclear negotiations, uh, according to Phil Gordon, who was an official in the Clinton and later Obama administrations, was one of malevolent neglect, quote, unquote. And uh, I remember when I was doing research for a book on the U.S. Iran, uh, and Iran, I was told by a European negotiator that John Bolton once fell asleep or pretended to while he was hosting members of the E3 who were giving him a briefing on the negotiations. And of course, John Bolton was the Under Secretary of State at the time in charge of nonproliferation, but not very interested in talking to Iran. Uh, the Bush administration policy, of course, changed uh, toward the end, and uh, we're going to hear about it, and we're going to hear where we are today. But I think it's fair to say that without the E3, there would be no process with Iran, and there certainly wouldn't have been the progress that we see today. So with that brief uh, introduction, let me introduce our wonderful guests. Um, 
Speaking first will be the Ambassador of France, Gérard Arrault, who has held numerous uh, positions within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Development, including Director for Strategic Affairs, Security and Disarmament, Ambassador to Israel, Director General for Political Affairs and Security, and Permanent Representative to the UN. Ambassador Arrault has specialized knowledge of the Middle East and strategic and security issues, and especially pertinent for our purposes, he was the French negotiator on the Iranian nuclear issue from 2006 to 2009. Uh, seated next to him is Peter Wittig, the ambassador of Germany. Uh, he also served as perm rep to the UN, and he served in Spain as private secretary to the foreign minister, ambassador to Lebanon and Cyprus, director general for the United Nations and global issues at the Foreign Office in Berlin. And finally, Sir Peter Westmacott has been Britain's ambassador here uh, since 2002. This is his second posting in Washington. He previously served as counselor for political and public affairs in the mid-90s. He's also been Britain's ambassador to France, to Turkey, uh, and had postings in Tehran and Brussels, uh, in, uh, as well as serving as Foreign and Commonwealth <laughs> Officers Director for the Americas. I've asked each of the three ambassadors to speak briefly. I know there are a lot of questions in this room and a lot of expertise. Um, <clears throat> ambassador Arrault is going to start, I think, with just a history of the talks, especially as he lived through it. Uh, so he will talk about how we went from uh, malevolent neglect to active participation. Uh, on the part of uh, uh, the Obama administration. And then uh, Ambassador Wittig is going to talk a little bit about the Lausanne understanding of April 2nd and uh, where that leaves us. And uh, Ambassador Westmacott is going to look at the regional dimensions of this nuclear agreement in the making. So please, Ambassador Arrault. Thank you. Good morning. Actually, uh, when I was told I was supposed to speak about history, my intention was to start by Cyrus the Great. Uh, but I was told that maybe it was a bit too, too long. Uh, so let's start in 2002 uh, when uh, a major uh, Iranian nuclear program, clandestine program, was revealed, which didn't have any identifiable uh, civilian uh, uh, significance. Uh, we, and my mother always told me, don't speak saying I, but actually I, as the director for strategic affairs, I drafted the letter. Uh, of uh, the, the, the ministers, the European ministers. And uh, to tell you what was our, our goal, I, I have to, to say uh, that at the time we had a choice between having the, signat the signature of UK or the signature of Russia. Uh, if we put in the text that we were asking the suspension of, of enrichment, we had uh, the Russian but not the UK, and if we put in the letter, stopping the enrichment, we are the UK, but not Russia. <laughs> and actually, France and Germany, and it was not easy. You know, it was, uh, you remember, it was in the spring of 2003, after the, the, the Iraqi invasion, uh, we decided that we wanted to have the UK, uh, because we knew that there wouldn't be an agreement if, at some moment, we couldn't have the trust, the confidence of the United States. At the time, uh, John Bolton, who was the Undersecretary for Strategic Affairs, uh, came to Paris. We presented the letter. There was also, uh, with the Israelis, we had the same consultation. And we got, in a sense, from both of them, we got a, a, yellow, uh, a yellow light. Mm -hmm. But at the condition that we would be totally transparent to both of them, and we were. When I was ambassador to Israel between three and six, Actually, I was the channel to inform the, the Israeli authorities of where we were, what we wanted. And I think it was extremely uh, productive. Uh, the negotiations between the three Europeans and the Iranians in the fall of 2003, uh, the, uh, the, the Iranians, uh, uh, you know, really suspended uh, the enrichment activities. Um, some people say that an opportunity was missed at this point. I don't know. It would be to the historians to say, but everything actually stopped in 2005 when Ahmadinejad was elected. Basically, the, the negotiation stopped there. And I can say that between 2005 and 2012, there was no negotiation whatsoever. As the French negotiator between six and nine, uh, we, I met 
dozens of times, the, the Iranians. We, we went, actually, the, uh, the five of us, because the, the, the American uh, negotiator, Bill Burns, couldn't come with us. We, we went to Tehran in 2008 with a letter signed by the six ministers. We made a, lo a lot of different proposals uh, to try to avoid you know, the question of suspending everything. But at no moment, between 5 and 12, the Iranians even entered the negotiation. They never told us, not it's not enough. There was no negotiation. Three hours, usually the first hour was about Cyrus the Great. The second hour <laughs> was about Mossadegh. The third hour was about the, right, the rights of the Iranian people. So that's the, 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 the reality. In 2006, the Americans, the Russians, uh, which is very important, and the Chinese joined us, which led to the first resolution, 1696, July, uh, July 2006, which was an ultimatum to the Iranians uh, to uh, suspend the enrichment, uh, to suspend the enrichment. They didn't do it, so there were afterwards the different resolutions of sanctions, 1737, 1747, 1803, 1835, 19. Uh, 20, uh, 29. It's very important. The Russians and the Chinese were with, with us. So we reached the point of, of, of 2012, and that's, I think, the first conclusion that we have to draw. In 2012, Iran took the decision of negotiating. The negotiation has started or restarted, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in 2012. And I, I stop here. <laughs> okay. Uh Maybe just a, yes. yeah, a, a tad more. You say 2012. Yes. Hassan Rouhani was not elected president until 2013. Uh, so what changed in no, 2012 think, in the no, Ahmadinejad? No, 2013. 2013. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, okay. Really, 2013. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Well, obviously, we could, we'll go more into this in the Q&A. But uh, Ambassador Wittig, um, 2013, Hassan Rouhani comes in. Yeah. Javad Zarif comes in. A new team that speaks English, does not insist on dredging through all past Iranian grievances. Uh, interim agreement? Oh, they, didn't sp they spoke English, you know, in 2006 also. They just chose <laughs> not they to. They spoke a very good English, actually. They <laughs> just chose, chose not to. Yeah. Um, you got the interim agreement November 2013, and then we have the Lausanne understanding. So tell us what you can about that understanding and the where we are right now in the negotiations, we have uh, about four weeks to go. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Barbara, for having, having me here. Uh, it's great to be here at the Atlantic Council. Yeah, on April 2nd, um, we concluded after lots of months of very intense negotiation, um, a um, political agreement, a basic political agreement on the per parameters uh, deal, final deal uh, with, uh, with Iran. Um, the framework um, is a big and I would say potentially hopeful uh, step uh, forward, but I have to add uh, right at the beginning a, a notion of caution here. Uh, the most difficult path uh, might uh, lay ahead of us in the, um, in the coming uh, weeks. Uh, are we sure that we will get uh, this final deal? No, uh, we are not sure. Uh, but we conduct those uh, negotiations uh, with a lot of determination in earnest, yet uh, without any naivete and, and very clear-eyed. Now, the task is um, to negotiate a comprehensive uh, solution, and the challenge is to transform basically political statements into um, reliable, um, uh, I also would say um, watertight, waterproof um, provisions uh, that leave no doubt uh, about the um, duties of, of the parties um, involved. Um, and um, as you know, in this kind of endeavor, uh, the devil is, of course, in the details. And, and therefore, uh, details matter. Uh, we have to come up uh, with a comprehensive agreement with a lot of annexes, so it's also um, not only a political, but a, a very technical negotiation. Um, so far, uh, since uh, 
the 2nd of April, the negotiations have been proceeding at a rather slow pace on an expert level. There are a lot of gaps and, and brackets, gaps to be filled, or brackets to be removed in, in the documents. Uh, not surprising to you, um, two issues are um, uh, in the particular focus. Um, first, um, uh, the timing of the sanctions relief uh, for Iran and, and um, the details of the verification and monitoring uh, mechanisms, um, those are uh, major topics. Now, um, Lausanne laid, uh, we believe, uh, the groundwork for three, um, three major goals vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Iran. First, strict limitations uh, on enrichment for the first 10 years. Now, um, Iran um, um, agreed uh, to reduce the centrifuges by uh, two-thirds, reduction from 19,000 to 6,104, uh, agreed to uh, not enrich beyond 3.67% um, and uh, reduce this for, for 15 years and uh, reduce the stockpile of low enriched uranium from roughly 10,000 kilogram to 300 uh, kilogram uh, for the next uh, 15 years. And um, on top of that, Iran would have no other or um, no new enrichment facility for the duration of the agreement. Second goal, the modernization of Iraq um, would effectively seal the plutonium path. Now, Lausanne provides um, the possibility uh, to modernize the existing heavy water facility in Iraq, uh, rebuild it, redesign it, so there could, no, uh, there could no, be no production of um, weapons-grade plutonium. That was the second. Third goal and key, really, uh, to, to an agreement is Iran would be submitted and subjected to an unprecedented uh, transparency and monitoring uh, regime to make sure that any covered program that Iran might be engaging in uh, would be, would be uh, detected. And, and strong procedures for intrusive in inspections in accordance with the additional protocol of the NPT <coughs> Uh, the Non-Proliferation Treaty and beyond would ensure that the international community is, uh, knows um, what, is, what, is, what is going on in Iran. What, we, what we would be the duties for us in this um, agreement, if it happens, in return for Iran's compliance, uh, there would be sanctions relief uh, the, of the UN sanctions, of uh, EU sanctions, of uh, US uh, sanctions gradually, and that's very important. It would happen gradually in the fields of um, economy, uh, trade, and, and finance. Iran um, needs some time to start uh, the implementation um, of this agreement, so in the best case, sanctions relief uh, would not happen before the end of this, this year. In addition, uh, this agreement would provide um, guarantees that sanctions put be back in place if Iran violates the agreement, the so-called snapback mechanism. Now, what are the prospects that we see uh, for, for, for this deal? For Iran, this would be a significant uh, shift. Um, Iran would be uh, deprived of the possibility to um, produce a nuclear weapon. At the same time, it would Iran give the opportunity uh, to adjust its uh, relations uh, to the international uh, community. Um, and um, we uh, believe it could also prevent uh, a nuclear arms race uh, in the region. Now, here again, uh, a note of caution. Uh, do we think um, that we can trust Iran with an agreement? I think the answer is no. And our motto would be distrust but verify. Um, trust has been broken in the past and, and need to be restored. That's why we can only accept a regime with a long lasting monitoring um, mechanism. Now do we um, 
condone um, Iran's behavior in the region? Absolutely not. Uh, we um, maintain sanctions that are not um, immediately related to this agreement. Uh, let's let's uh, give an example of the war arms embargo. And of course, we would continue to urge Iran to play a very constructive role on all the e regional <coughs> conflicts that are on our mind, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Yemen. Now, um, in concluding, we believe that the alternatives to our diplomatic, diplomatic approach um, are not very attractive. If diplomacy fails, um, uh, then um, the sanctions regime might unravel, the sanctions, the universal sanctions regime, and we would probably see Iran once again enriching as it has done uh, before negotiations uh, started. Uh, it's clear uh, the problems that we have with Iran will not go away immediately um, with, with a deal, um, uh, but it has a potential to um, engage in a phase of constructive um, conflict resolution uh, with, with Iran. So we believe um, it serves our security interests in Europe. We believe it serves the US security interests. We serve, it serves the regional security interests. And believe me, um, Israel's security is always um, on our mind. So in a nutshell, uh, a negotiated, satisfactory deal is our best option we have. Okay. Um, Ambassador Westmacott, I'd like to ask you to look at the regional dimension, but also if you could comment. Uh, I was a little surprised, Ambassador Wittig, that you say sanctions relief wouldn't come till the end of the year. And I wonder, is that because it's going to take Iran that long to implement the key steps, or is this still something that's being negotiated? The Iranians say sanctions relief is going to be immediate upon its implementation of the key steps. Um, do you want to pick up? Um. <laughs> Not a lot left to say. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Damon. Thank you, Atlantic Council, for giving us uh, this opportunity to uh, sit up on stage. I won't say like the three monkeys, but we are three colleagues who are always <laughs> pleased to be together. Uh, Gerard mentions the, uh, the way the Iranians go back to Cyrus the Great. And of course, when you're talking to Iranians, the history is always an important part of it. But there is a certain irony in the fact that it was Cyrus the Great who was the Persian king who liberated the Jews of Babylon from King Nebuchadnezzar, a story we're all reminded of when the British Museum's Cyrus Cylinder came for a state visit to Washington and other major US cities a little over a year ago. So they're very conscious of their history, but I think it's worth us being conscious of it as well. Um, the regional dimension and uh, the point perhaps which Barbara picked up, I would like to uh, echo very much what, what Peter Wittig says on where we think we are now, um, the importance of the framework that we have got, uh, the quality of that deal. Uh, but I would add that, of course, between now and the end of June, there is still a great deal of detailed work to be completed. You know, it's not yet in the bag, and we are all very clear that if we can't get the right deal, then there won't be a deal. But this is... Uh, significantly better the framework that we have got at the moment in our judgment, the judgment of our governments, than any of the alternatives that are out there uh, for preventing Iran from getting nuclear weapons. So I think it is a piece of diplomacy which is extremely important, which has taken a very long time uh, to get this far. Um, the regional dimension, uh, of course, this was a, a big part of the G7 uh, summit arrangement, which President Obama hosted with leaders from the GCC uh, just the other day, uh, not least because it is clear that a number of the Sunni Arab regional governments are concerned about the implications of uh, this deal if it is finalized. Um, I would say that none of us are doing this on a basis of blind trust. As Peter says, we will distrust but verify. Uh, this is uh, the best of the options that are out there, and this represents uh, the best framework uh, that we have been able to come up with for ensuring that for at least a decade uh, there's not going to be any Iranian breakout towards uh, nuclear weapons, and that Iran will thereafter, of course, be subject not only to the provisions of the NPT, but also to the, those of the additional protocol which Iran will be signing. So we think that this is something which uh, gives us a chance for um, minimizing the risk of proliferation of nuclear weapons and introducing a degree of regional stability, which is important. At the same time, uh, we need to reassure 
the regionals, the others around there, who are concerned by other aspects of bad behavior by Iran, which are quite separate from the nuclear issue which we have been negotiating on, uh, that there will not be, if you like, uh, a carte blanche for the Iranians to continue to destabilize the region through the use of proxies or through other areas of activity. It is our hope, uh, but we are not naive on this, that if we are able to finalize this nuclear deal with the Iranians, uh, that there will be spin-off, if you like, in terms of other areas of uh, regional concern. Uh, we would like to see Iran doing a great deal less in terms of supporting groups which either de <coughs> destabilize governments we regard as legitimate or indirectly supporting terrorist activity and so on. And that would be a, a significant prize. Uh, but the fact that we are working on the nuclear thing does not mean in any sense that we are closing our eyes to the other aspects of what goes on in the region uh, and, and which concerns us. So uh, that's going to be very important. Regional reassurance on security issues and, of course, uh, full implementation on the deal, if there is a deal, which we conclude by the end of June. Uh, I think, Barbara, on your question of what about uh, implementation, I think it's very clear that uh, uh, sanctions lift will take place when there is implementation of uh, the agreement. Um, that depends on how long it takes the IAEA to certify that there is full compliance by Iran of the agreements that it undertakes in uh, the um, negotiation. We don't yet know exactly what day that will be. Um, of course, each side is busy explaining why what it has agreed to so far is a good thing for its own public opinion. That is what negotiations are about. Everybody has to return home with something which they are proud of, which they are pleased about. Nobody's going to go home and say, we capitulated on everything. This is a lousy deal for my own constituents. That's not the way negotiations work. So I think the important thing is to, con to focus on what's going on in the negotiations themselves, which by definition uh, have to remain largely confidential for the moment, to try to ensure that we get the right deal, and then we ensure uh, that there is full compliance. And as a result of that, then you can move towards uh, uh, suspension of sanctions and so on. Of course, there are different elements of sanctions. There are UN ones, there are US bilateral ones, uh, there are European ones. The one thing I would add, I think, on this is that uh, we need to keep in mind that the reason why we have come this far is because there have been an extraordinary degree of transatlantic unity uh, on the application of the sanctions. The EU and the US, the financial and the oil, uh, and a number of other elements have been, I think, a great deal more effective than many people would have predicted. Uh, we have got this far on the basis of that. We now need to make a success of the diplomacy, which effective sanctions have, has given us the chance to complete. Very good. Let me ask a little bit more about uh, unity, uh, not just with the United States, but also among the E3. Uh, Ambassador Aro, your foreign minister has a, has a certain penchant for uh, revealing little details of the negotiations at, at various times that, uh, that perhaps have not always been helpful. Just the other day, he said that the Iranians are insisting on, I think, a 24-day waiting period before any allegations of, uh, of cheating uh, can be investigated. Uh, is this helpful to the negotiations to reveal these little bits? And are you always on the same page in terms of uh, the negotiations? Of course it's helpful since it's my minister. So. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, um, you know, I think in any country, and especially in this country, you know, one, one country takes an initiative, you know, it's supposed to be a sort of uh, based on a very good analysis of the situation. And when this country, one country commits a mistake, it's out of good intention. And when it's the other, another country takes an initiative or commits a mistake, it's out of cynicism or it's rec for reckless <laughs> reasons. I'm going to tell you, uh, you know, really to your utter disbelief uh, secret, uh, the, uh, the French foreign policy is neither more nor, nor less moral and intelligent than the US one. Uh, so it means that what we are doing in a very technical and a very political issue is based on our own analysis. And nuances are legitimate. You know, really, in a negotiation, you have to understand that even our technical experts disagree from time to time. You know, really, you have the poor ministers or the poor diplomats, and you have the nuclear experts who are discussing about the issues. And of course, the ministers and the diplomats don't understand a word of what, what, what is exchanged. But basically, there is a disagreement. The negotiations are extremely complicated technically. They're also extremely complicated because you have a lot of different issues which are linked. 
the number of ultra centrifuges is linked to the stockpile that you are going to, to, to allow, for instance. And I could multiply the examples of, uh, which means that it's very likely that we won't have an agreement before the end of June or even the, after June. You know, the Iranians for the moment are obviously not negotiating to get an agreement very shortly. They, they want to, put, to, to push the, the issues to the ministers the way they did previously. Mm -hmm. So we are going to have a sort of melodrama at the end of June, <laughs> ministers not sleeping, door the slammed, the, 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 you know, I'm leaving to Tehran, no way, and so on. <laughs> Uh, to try to get the best uh, to get the best deal, but if even if we get the best deal, you know afterwards you will have to translate it into the the technical annexes. So it may be you know we could have a sort of fuzzy end uh, to uh, to the negotiation. Um, can, can I add yes, something? Yes, if you to, could on, on to, transatlantic to, to the unity. Absolutely, yes. Mm. Um, I think it's hard to exaggerate um, the degree of cohesion that we as three Europeans have on every level. I mean, our experts meet on a weekly basis or are on the phone, sometimes on a daily basis. Our leaders meet, uh, meet on Iran. And as you said yourself, the three Europeans were at the genesis of this, at the inception mm -hmm. of, of, of this whole process. But I want to add two things. Um, I think it also deserves mention that uh, Russia and China uh, were, uh, a very, were very constructive partners uh, over the last uh, 17 months or how, how many months uh, that was um, uh, since the beginning of the negotiations in November uh, 2013. Um, and that maybe came to the surprise of some uh, because you could have feared that, let's say, the Ukraine crisis uh, would have contaminated uh, all those negotiations around Iran. That did not happen. So there was unity among the five uh, plus one. And another, I think, element here in the genesis deserves mention, and that is, as I would say, the rather courageous step by the American administration to engage directly with Iran. I think that <laughs> it was a catalyst for, for pro progress. And uh, of course, it, it was not self-evident that after those long years of a vacuum in relations with Iran, um, the administration would engage uh, with Iran directly, and I think those elements helped uh, to forge that, that, that unity and, and make that progress. Mm -hmm. Ambassador, any thoughts on the unity of the three? No? Nothing to uh, add. I agree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One other, and then I'm going to open up uh, to the audience, and that is uh, the impact of the sanctions on uh, European economies. As, as you rightly pointed out, Ambassador uh, Westmacott, it, it was the fact uh, uh, that the Europeans agreed to stop buying Iranian oil, by and large, to stop investing in Iran, to cut back trade drastically, to impose sanctions on the banks uh, that got us to, to where we are, certainly, in, in, in many respects. How, how much of an impact has, had that, has that had on your economies? And uh, if, for some reason, there isn't a deal, can you hold the line, really, on sanctions? Can they persist in, in the European Union? Uh, given the eagerness of many of your companies to go back to And Iran. the U.S. companies also. Mm. Well, are U.S. Very, companies... Are very eager to go. Another mm. story. They have other problems. Not, not more, not less than the European companies. Okay. Perhaps you want to start with that. You know, I think that <laughs> Iran is a country with immense potential, commercial, um, political, uh, and in lots of other areas. Uh, I sometimes like to point out to people who say to me, I can't understand why you guys are negotiating with those Iranians, uh, that you don't see very many Iranian Shia strapping on suicide vests and blowing up airplanes. The young Iranians that I talk to want to get a green card and come to America and make a million dollars. Uh, they're quite <laughs> pragmatic, especially the young. It doesn't mean to say that the regime is, that, is like that, but I think there is a great deal of, of potential uh, uh, of that sort. If you go to Iran today, you will find, uh, despite the effectiveness of our sanctions, but precisely because of the black market, uh, that there is uh, a, an appetite for an awful lot of Western produce. They have to pay a very high price for it because of the way in which uh, things like that operate. Things come across certain borders, uh, stretches of water, uh, at a price. So I think it's not surprising that a lot of companies uh, would like to do business in Iran. It has great potential, it has great natural resource, natural wealth. Uh, and at the right moment, um, hopefully not at the wrong moment, uh, companies will start looking again at that. 
I think it's very hard to be clear about what happens to sanctions in the event that there is not a deal. If there is not a deal because the Iranians simply will not uh, live up to or implement, if you like, the broad parameters which we have agreed in the framework, then I think we carry on with the sanctions regime and in certain areas it may be right to try to uh, raise the level of those sanctions. But this is the area of hypothesis. Uh, at the same time, if we were to walk away or if the Congress was to make it impossible for the uh, agreement to be implemented or, or whatever, uh, then I think the international community would be pretty reluctant, frankly, to contemplate a ratcheting up further of a sanctions against Iran. My sense is that we are probably not far away from the high watermark of international sanctions yes. against the Iranian economy, but exactly what happens next depends on what happens. If there is clear evidence of bad faith and the Iranians are not prepared to live up to what they've said they're prepared to live up to, if we're not prepared to have <laughs> adequate inspection of sites and, and transparency and so on, then I think we're in one area of territory. But if we're in another one, because the rest of us have decided we don't want to do this, uh, then it becomes much more complicated. And you're already seeing a number of countries which, of course, don't respect the embargo on oil. But you know Russia and China and India and so on already, and Turkey already buying certain quantities uh, from Iran. I suspect we would probably see more sanctions erosion rather than less, uh, unless uh, the deal collapsed because of reasons that were uh, visibly, clearly, incontrovertibly uh, Iran's responsibility. Mm -hmm. Dr. Wittig, the impact on Germany I know has been pretty significant. Yeah. Yes, we had um, very long, very traditional, very friendly uh, relations with Iran pre Khomeini, and um, uh, we had strong economic ties. Uh, so uh, the, the sanctions regime uh, was um, hurting our uh, businesses uh, a lot, and many of the companies, especially the big companies, just pulled out of, um, out of Iran, like the automakers or Siemens. Um, so it, it did hurt, um, and, and, and uh, that's a fact, and um, I think uh, I echo what um, Peter has said. Uh, the potential uh, for an agreement is, of course, also a potential <coughs> for all our economies. And it would benefit not all our economies. Not that we rush back into Iran. Mm -hmm. We will be very cautious, and the government advises our companies actively to hold back. But it, 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 it could be uh, uh, carry a huge potential, not only for us, but also for the young Iranian generation. As Peter said, they are looking to the West. And it might entice um, or might trigger some internal change in Iran. Ambassador Rowe, it's my understanding that what comes off from the US side initially are the secondary sanctions mm. that inhibit foreign companies from mm. investing in Iran. So you say American companies are eager, but American companies are going to be largely shut out, aren't they? At the but they are in Dubai, for instance. You know, really, I suppose that is for the charm of Dubai, but they mm. are in Dubai. <laughs> you know, really, it's... Uh... No, it hurt also, of course, my, my country. Uh, for instance, the automakers, you know, we were providing, uh, I guess, 30% of the Iranian market, and all the gears were made in one small city in France. And, and of course, the city was devastated by, mm. uh, by the city, sanctions. Which city was that? Really a small city in the east of France. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, you know, and also our uh, oil company made, oil company had made a strategic choice of investing in Iran. And this co oil company was, of course, lost. Uh, 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 its investment, so it hurt. Uh, but there is no, we, are, we, you know, we have held firm for the last uh, 10 years. There is no reasons that we won't do it uh, in the coming years. Okay, I'm going to open. Uh, please wait for the microphone and state your name. And Trita, we'll start right here. And ask a question. Please, yeah. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you for putting on this excellent event, and thank you to the three ambassadors for being here. Um, it was mentioned that there's been a tremendous amount. Introduce yourself. Oh, Trita Parsi from the National Iranian American Council. It was mentioned that there's been a tremendous amount of unity between uh, the EU3, within the EU3, and with the United States, and that's, I think, uh, difficult to doubt. I want to ask you uh, to get into a hypothetical. Let's assume that there is a deal uh, uh, late June. The president has to then report it to the Senate within five days. The Senate has 30 days or so to be able to review it and then cast a vote. Let's assume there is a resolution to reject the deal and the resolution passes. The president has the option or 
the obligation, perhaps, to veto it. What will the EU3 do between the resolution of rejection passing and the president putting in his veto and then facing a challenge to that veto? Who would like to <laughs> take that hot potato? Yes, I'll, make, I'll make a very brief comment. Uh, I mean, you, uh, <laughs> forgive me for saying this, but you're getting a little bit ahead of the game. Um, what we're <laughs> focusing on now is trying to get this deal. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, when we get to that stage, then we will see what the different uh, elements are that follow. Uh, my government, I have to say, hasn't yet worked out what the answer to your question, your hypothetical question would be, but we'll have to take all this in stages. I think the important point for the moment is to bear in mind you know, the, the long journey that we have embarked upon. Uh, can we now get this thing uh, over the finishing line uh, at the end of June? We, we hope so, but that depends on an awful lot of different elements. Uh, the President's commitment has been very clear to, if that is the case, to uh, selling this to the United States Congress, to the, to the American people, and so on. So I think we, we take this in one stage uh, at a time. Uh, it may well be that at the stage where we get a deal, that there is something that the rest of us can do to help explain that this is not just a US-Iran deal, but this is something which the international community in, uh, in general, and the P5 plus one in particular, th three representatives here, uh, are, are party to, support Evolve, and want to see uh, made into a success. But I don't think, I personally can't go any further into the area of hypothesis that you want to lead us at this stage. <laughs> okay. Uh, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, Harlan, right here. <laughs> Pleasure to be on Barbara's uh, Iranian task force. Uh, I'm going to ask a question which gives you the opportunity to get in great trouble with your government. Yeah, here you are. <laughs> I don't like the mic's off. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask a question which oh, I can It's still networking, yeah. Out. Bring the other one over if you would, yeah. Dead mic. <laughs> Is this better? Yes. Go <clears throat> I'm going to ask a question which can give you an opportunity to get into great trouble with your governments. Um, <laughs> obviously, we have to be thinking the what ifs. Assuming the deal does not go through and blame can be laid legitimately at Iran's door, what do you see as viable options? Because you know in Israel and the Congress there are going to be loud voices calling for some kind of military action. And alternatively, if the deal does go through and can be verified, what opportunities do you see created in the Middle East, much of which is now in chaos, but could obviously benefit from this particular agreement? Mr. Uh, I think I won't answer to the first part because, again, it's, it's quite uh, hypothetical. <coughs> so we'll, you know, we'll, in a sense, the sanctions will remain in force. And the questions will be uh, maybe to increase the level of sanctions, even if, as, as, as Peter said, uh, I guess we have we are very close to the high mark of the sanction. Um, as for what would happen after uh, uh, an agreement, again, in a very hypothetical way, looking at uh, in the, the crystal ball, my bet, personal bet, I'm very good at making personal bets, is that the Iranians will want to prove, the Iranian regime will want to prove that it doesn't mean that he has changed his policy, uh, that we could have an outburst of anti-American rhetoric uh, during the few months after the agreement, you know, really. The second element is I, we have been very careful to dissociate the nuclear negotiation from the other issues, and I think it's, it's very important because if you start to make a big deal, you know, you start to exchange Yemen against 1,000 ultracentrifuges. So it starts to be very, very dangerous. So the nuclear issue as such. You know, after that, you have the other uh, uh, geopolitical issues, but I'm not sure that these geopolitical <coughs> issues are linked to the nuclear issue. You know, really, they are linked to the fact that all the region has been geopolitically destroyed. You know, first by the invasion of Iraq, uh, you know, because Iraq has played a major role, as you know, as a sort of a dam uh, against Persian ambitions for 1,000 years. The crisis that we have uh, in the Sunni world which means that basically nature abhors vacuum. So Iran is moving forward basically because there is nothing uh, to stop it. So I don't think there is a, a linkage between the nuclear issues and the geopolitical crisis of, 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 uh, of the Middle East. Okay. But that's personal. Mm -hmm. uh, Elise, wait for the microphone. Yeah. 
Elise Labatt with CNN. Thanks, Barbara. Um, I'd like to follow up a little bit on that and, and just kind of tie in um, what you were talking about, the unity um, of the P5 plus one. Obviously, you've gone to great lengths to keep a lot of the geopolitical issues out of the discussions, but I was wondering if you could talk to the extent that the, the, this long baggage between the uh, United States and Iran, whether it plays into it at all. I mean, you know, at the beginning of this process, the United States was really the, even before, you know, your current governments, years ago, the United States was the one being so tough. I've heard diplomats from one or more of your countries speak privately about how the United States now is the one that wants the deal the most. So, I mean, given all of that, given that President Obama definitely wants a deal with this government, you have today the trial of um, Washington Post jur journalist Jason Rezian starting. How does that all play in to the, the kind of negotiations and, and the tone of the room? Thank you. Ambassador Whitt, do, does the U.S. want it more than you know? Well, we all want it, but we don't want it at any price. Um, and I think this is what we made clear. We uh, are here to negotiate in earnest with a lot of determination. But if we don't get a satisfactory deal, there won't be a deal. So, so, so that is clear. And we are focusing now on the, on the four or five weeks ahead of us. And, and then all those hypothetical questions come afterwards. But um, I, you know, I want to elaborate also a little bit on, on the connection to other issues. You could kill um, this deal if you link it to uh, extraneous issues. Uh, you know, what does I I uh, Iran do in Yemen? Uh, does it uh, cease to support the Hezbollah, etc.? If you link it to those issues, you can kill it. This is what we don't want. No, c no, no, no linkage. But of course, there is a potential in a successful deal to improve relations with Iran and to encourage Iran to be a more responsible stakeholder in the region. And that potential we want to explore once the deal is done. Okay. Um, wow, so many. Uh, I'm going to go to the back to Daryl, and then I'll come back up front. Wait for the mic. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Daryl Kimball, Arms Control Association. Um, Ambassador Aro, I'm glad you went into the history. Um, and I wanted to ask you one question I think you can answer about the history to clarify uh, the purpose of the resolutions that were passed at the Security Council regarding suspension of enrichment. There's the perception among many here in Washington that those resolutions were uh, designed or intended uh, to require Iran to stop forever uh, uranium enrichment. Um, as I understand it, the purpose was to facilitate a long-term solution that respects a peaceful program. Um, could you just elaborate on the thinking a little bit? Uh, about the, and the purpose of the, the resolutions. Um, that's uh, something that many in Washington I don't think quite understand. And this is an issue, of course, for the future uh, negotiations, uh, updating those resolutions. Could you give us an update on uh, whether that continues to be an issue? Uh, are you confident that that will be uh, resolved in time to uh, facilitate a comprehensive solution? So. <clears throat> when we started the, the resolutions of sanctions, uh, uh, the first one, 1737, uh, actually our, the rationale of what we were doing was basically uh, to change the calculation of the regime. You know, really basically uh, to convince the regime uh, for its own survival, in a sense, uh, that uh, the program was becoming too costly, you know, really. You have to understand, the, 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 the Iranians have spent billions of dollars on this program, on a program which doesn't make any civilian uh, uh, meaning, that doesn't have any civilian meaning. So, and when we went to Tehran in 2008, the, the five political directors and Mr. Solana, we met a lot of, of Iranians, and basically uh, the sanctions were only starting to, to hurt, but the management of the economy was so inept that really the situation was, was, was very, very serious and afterwards it has only uh, uh, worsened. So we do think, but of course there is no uh, evidence for that, that the sanctions have changed effectively the calculation of the regime. As for the enrichment, personally from the beginning, uh, I, I have always been convinced that 
at the end of the day, we would want, we would be, we would have to keep some enrichment capability in Iran, because as Peter said, in a negotiation, uh, you know, each side has to be able to come back home saying, I am the winner. And considering the investment of the Iranians into the enrichment, uh, financial but also symbolic, uh, there should be some enrichment capability in Iran. After that, the challenge is to make it innocuous in terms of nuclear proliferation. And that's all what we are trying to do uh, during these, these, nego these negotiations. Okay, uh, lady in front here, wait for the microphone. Good morning, I'm Nathalie Goulet, I'm a French senator. Um, um, I have a, um, a question. Um, regarding the amount of mistrust uh, between Iran and the international community, how do you, do you think that uh, international community, including the negotiator, would be able to reset the machinery? Because with such a mistrust, it, it's almost impossible. Could you give us a hint? We sell the machinery? Yeah, reset the position, reset. yes. Okay. Well, I think we mentioned that one key element of this possible deal is a very, very intrusive mechanism, a regime of transparency and verification. And that's key to the whole deal. So we, we will have eyes, the International <coughs> Atomic Energy Organization will have eyes on what Iran is doing. And we are confident that a regime can be devised that would detect any covert operation that uh, Iran is engaging or would be engaging in. So uh, the regime of verification, of monitoring, is key to any agreement that we conclude. Okay. Uh, Laura? Thanks. Laura Rosen from Al Monitor. Um, Ambassador Wittig, you mentioned it's going very slowly now post Lausanne and trying to draft the deal. And uh, Ambassador Rowe, you said that you anticipated a certain degree of brinksmanship and, you know, late nights, the, the end of June and possibly beyond. Can you talk about why you think it's going so slowly now and um, is there just not substantive seriousness? And related to that, um, do you think, you know, is Kerry and Zarif trying to dominate the process to the exclusion of the other ministers and other nations? Or is Kerry, do you think, trying to do that? Is, are the Iranians waiting for the, you know, the U.S. to send the, the secretaries and money? Is that your sense? Well, it's going slow because um, the substance of the issues are difficult. They are technical. That's one point. And the second is there is a dynamic in negotiations. You need the pressure of timeline in order to uh, facilitate sort of the heavy lifting of issues. So both factors are at work here. But I, I, I'm, not, I'm not particularly worried. I think this is fairly normal. Um, as I said before, um, we, we have a, a difficult path uh, to, to walk on. Uh, we, we have um, tremendously complicated technical issues to clarify, and so small wonder that we, we are not making a lot of um, fast progress right now. But um, it's not a prediction on, on, what we, um, on what will happen by the end of June. It's just sort of a feeling of the pulse uh, right now. Uh, so I'm still confident that we can over overcome um, those uh, divergences of views uh, that, that, that we have right now. Um. I'm going to go here, but before, uh, before we take the next question, I neglected to mention at the beginning, let me say it now, that I wanted to thank the Plowshares Fund for their, great, uh, for their generous support of the Iran Task Force. And also, uh, our regrets that Stu Eisenstadt, who was an ambassador to the EU and is chairman of our task force, was not able to be here today because he is in Europe, of course. Um, so, Jonathan. Uh, for anyone on the panel, Jonathan Landay with McClatchy Newspapers. Uh, over the weekend, we heard uh, new statements from Iran that uh, senior scientists would not be allowed to be uh, interviewed. Uh, we heard that military facilities will not be open to inspections. And that all links back to an issue that we haven't talked about here, which is the possible military dimensions of Iran's program and the IEA aspect, which seems to have gotten no progress whatsoever at all during 
the negotiations that have been going on separately. Um, there is some concern among some that uh, that issue, uh, whether or not the Iranians were in fact um, uh, designing a missile-borne uh, nuclear warhead, will be papered over. Uh, will there, there's some kind of calculation will be made or, or, or uh, equation will be made that will allow them not to have to um, uh, uh, make the admissions they are doing in order to set a baseline for the inspection program that you're talking about. Can you talk about uh, how the a possible military dimensions aspect of this feeds into the talks right now because there's no progress on that aspect right now. Ambassador, I'm also going to add to that that uh, uh, Arachi, the deputy negotiator, said something about managed access to nuclear facilities, which was in direct contradiction to what the Supreme Leader and some of the other Iranian officials have said. Now, actually, I, you know, I, it, it, you know, all these negotiations, you know, really, I, after all these negotiations, I feel like writing a, a, an article about what is a negotiation, you know, really. So at the beginning of the negotiation, there is chess banging. You know, really, at the beginning of the negotiation, it demands my, too much importance to the declarations. You know, really, at the beginning, uh, you know, the Iranians say, uh, we demand an absolute immediate lifting of the sanctions. It won't happen. It <laughs> won't happen. And, and there will be an agree, and there may be an agreement, even if there is not an absolute lifting, an immediate lifting of, of the sanctions. Uh, on the PMD, I can tell you, and especially the French, we are very keen on having, uh, uh, you know, an element of the art, an element of the, the agreement on the PMD. We are not going to let the PMD uh, issue uh, under, under under the carpet, you know, really. So again, the negotiations for the moment, for the moment. Uh, obviously, the negotiations is not to moving forward very, very quickly. Uh, it means that uh, I guess the, the Iranians make the calculation that it could be easier to get uh, uh, concessions from the ministers uh, uh, with some dramatization, you know, really a good, a good deal of dramatization because negotiations, there is also, it's also a theater. There are some theatricals in the, in the negotiations, you know, and, and I'm not bad at that. Uh, so, uh, so really, uh, so don't listen to, to the, the, the outside declarations. There will be something on PMD. There, the sanctions will be lifted if there is an implementation in an incremental, a reversible, conditional, uh, con conditional way. But each side will have to be able uh, to tell its public, op its public opinion that actually he, he got the day. <laughs> Gentlemen um, here has been very. Oh, sorry. Uh, Barbara, Please. maybe yeah. um, to uh, to your hint of the declaration of Arakshi. Yeah. I think um, correcting or apparently correcting modifying the statement. Yeah. I, I think he he was mindful of the additional protocol uh, <laughs> of the NPT, where um, it it contains uh, provisions that provide for access to military sites. So I think Arakshi is mindful mm -hmm. of the obligations of that, uh, military, of that additional protocol. Okay. I'll add one sentence on that. Sure. I mean, there's the, there's the additional protocol uh, to the NPT, but there's also going to be agreement on a joint commission, which ensures that mm -hmm. there is proper inspections under our own mm -hmm. agreement with the Iranians, separate from their NPT obligations, separate from the additional protocol. This is hugely important to all of us, that there has to be a, a proper inspections regime so that we can, if we have reason to believe or re legitimate requests to go and visit this or that site, that we will be able to do so. This is still being discussed in some detail, um, but we're not going to, as Gerard was saying, we're not going to let this issue disappear. Okay. This will be an important part of the final stage of the negotiation. That's an important clarification. Gentleman in the middle who's been very patient. Please say your Thanks. name. Thanks. John Hudson with Foreign Policy Magazine. Uh, Ambassador Aro, uh, speaking of the art of diplomacy, um, the sort of walk back on the allowance of managed inspections, uh, does this dispel the notion that has been perpetuated for a while that the Iranian negotiators are perpetually boxed in by anything that the Supreme Leader tweets or says? Uh, is, there, is there clearly some give there? I really, again, I, I, I really don't know what are the, the inner, uh, you know, momentum of, of, of the negotiation uh, in Iran. Uh, 
the Iranian negotiators are negotiating under, you know, really under instructions. They have their own uh, public opinion with, with their own divisions of the public opinion, the same way that uh, you have in the US, you know, and in the West and, and, and in our free, uh, free countries. And they have, to take into, they have to take into account this settlement the same way that the US administration has to take into, uh, into account the, the, the opinion of the, of the Congress. No negotiation is really uh, uh, simply a sort of technical or even political uh, without, uh, really without a public opinion, which is, you know, in a sense, the background of, of, of the situation. Okay. Uh, gentleman here, and then. Thank you, Barbara, for this great discussion. I'm Namo Abdullah with Ruda, which is Kurdistan's 24-hour news agency. Uh, I have a question about the potential impacts of a nuclear deal on the situation of human rights in Iran, and particularly for the minorities such as the Kurdish people. Do you expect their situations improve, or will the world basically turn a blind eye for strategic interests? Thank you. Who wants to take up the human rights question? I mean, um, I'll make a general comment. I think that all of our governments remain very concerned uh, about the human rights situation in Iran. Uh, there are things which are done there which worry us uh, for all sorts of different reasons. Sometimes it's about the way individuals are treated. Sometimes it is about the way uh, different minorities are treated. Sometimes there are surprising elements. That you can see that there are elements of the Jewish community, for example, in Iran, which are able to thrive. There are Baha'is who absolutely reverse, are regarded as heretics and, and have no level of tolerance. I think there are a number of, of, of respects in which uh, Iran has a long way to go in terms of meeting international standards on human rights. Um, <laughs> I'm not expert on, on the situation regarding the Kurdish minority inside Iran, uh, but this is certainly an area in which, uh, the, the broader human rights area, where we would look to Iran, especially if we are able to conclude this agreement, to be moving very much more in the direction of international standards of behavior than we witness at the moment. Iran could start by letting Jason Rezi and our colleague go. That would be a very good step. Mark, uh, right there, wait for the mic. Mark Katz, George Mason University. Uh, Ambassador Vitek, I was quite reassured when you indicated that uh, Russia and China are being helpful. Uh, but I'm just wondering, uh, in this final stages of the negotiations, how helpful is Russia actually being, especially in light of their decision to resume uh, S-300 air defense ballistic missile system shipments to Iran? Uh, one would have thought that to be really helpful, this would have been sort of held out as a, as a carrot if negotiations were successful, and yet they've gone ahead and done this. I also note there's rumblings in the Russian press about um, that, in fact, uh, maybe, maybe a, a nuclear deal wouldn't be such a great thing for Russia if it means that Iran's relations with the West improve, and also even rumblings that if, if the West isn't understanding on Ukraine, Russia can can be less helpful on Iran. I'm sort of from the older generation that sees what happens in the Russian press is not, not accidental. So I'm wondering if anyone would care to comment on Russia's motives and how helpful it is, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Well, um, to be very straightforward, um, we thought uh, the decision to uh, deliver um, those kind of weapons uh, were not um, helpful at all uh, for the process and were uh, a deplorable decision. But also, um, uh, let me remind you, this was not a decision that violated, violated the arms embargo. So it was not something that violated international law, but it was, uh, we believe, uh, a decision that was not helpful for the process. But at the same time, and, uh, uh, you know, really, again, uh, it, it has always been very important to have the Chinese and the Russians on board to show that it's not the West against a ganging against, uh, uh, against Iran. And the, and the Russians and the Chinese have been very, really perfect loyal negotiators in this process. And they are still. They are really doing their part of the, the job, working, working with us. And as for the, this system of weapons, I, of course, I, we share the, the, what, what Peter has said, but also the Russians have taken the, uh, really the, uh, have precise that the, the system could be, couldn't be operational before one or two years. 
you know, really, and uh, they took the, you know, really, they, 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 they told us, which means that really they, they, they didn't want to simply to break the China, you know, uh, about uh, on, on this negotiation. No, I think I saw something, Mark, in the paper just the other day saying that mm -hmm. the, the, these weapons will probably not go yeah, yeah. until there, there is an exactly. agreement. So it's more of a carrot. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, gentleman back there. Um, Peter Bombush, I'm a lawyer in Washington. The question is, are the, is the position of the West credible? Because the position of the West, it seems to me, is that if you do not do this deal, we're going to continue the sanctions or enhance the sanctions. But I've heard today how this may be the high watermark of sanctions. Our own businesses don't like the sanctions. Do we have a credible threat in the negotiation? Yes. Why? Right. I don't understand. I, I think I think what what the gentlemen have the ambassadors have said is that it depends on how negotiations break down if they break down. Yeah. If it's perceived to be the fault of the U.S. Congress or <laughs> others on on this side of the negotiating, um, then the sanctions regime will unravel probably pretty quickly. But if it's perceived to be the Iranians walking away from a good deal. Uh, presumably there would still be some sanctions discipline, at least in Europe. I don't know, if, is that true for the Russians? Is that true for the Chinese? That's, you know, would, would the P5 plus one then split? Well, I, I guess uh, I agree with you. It depends on uh, who's to blame mm -hmm. or if there's no deal. And, and I think we should not harbor any illusions about the um, international um, sanctions regime. I think uh, many of the emerging uh, countries um, would consider Congress blocking this deal as maybe as a trigger mm -hmm. um, to um, at least question uh, the present sanctions regime. So uh, I would see uh, a certain uh, danger uh, if the blame game um, you know, in the international community comes to the conclusion that it's not the Iran that is to blame, then uh, the, the international solidarity that has been uh, quite strong uh, in the recent years would, would most probably erode. That's a, that's a scenario. Mm -hmm. But in legal terms, no. Because in legal terms, the, the, the sanctions of the UN Security Council could, could be lifted only uh, because of our vote. Right. So really, so the sanctions on the Security Council remain in for, and the vote of the U.S. Mm -hmm. So the sanctions of the Security Council will remain in place. Uh, the U.S. sanctions will remain, uh, remain in place. And the EU sanctions to be lifted also will need a um, unanimous vote. So the sanctions will remain in any case. So it's really, it's... Uh, but the implementation, you know, that, 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 that's... The but the most, the most effective uh, sanctions are usually the U.S. sanctions uh, mm. because of their extraterritorial uh, aspects. So, it's, uh, so I guess that uh, a lot of uh, corporations are implementing sanctions simply because they are afraid, uh, the non-European uh, um, corporations, because they are afraid of the U.S. sanctions. Ambassador, have they started actually drafting a new UN Security Council resolution, or not yet? For I think there is. I, I, but I don't. I don't know. I think there is a, a, a draft somewhere. I, I read, but in the reports. But uh, yes, I think there is a draft. Yes. Uh, the, the, one of the questions is about the sanctions. Uh, what what you, I think you call back. Mm -hmm. Snapback, you know, mm -hmm. really the way sanctions will be rein, really uh, uh, re, uh, reimposed if the, the, the Iranians were not respecting their, their, their commitments. So there are some texts uh, really floating around. Okay. Right here in the front. Oda Aberdeen, my question to His Excellency, the French ambassador. Your president has been in Saudi Arabia recently and in the Gulf, and it seems that France and the GCC have excellent relationships. Now, based on that, have you been able to persuade the GCC that the nuclear deal that's being negotiated will enhance their security rather than undermine their security? No, I, you know, I think you, you, you should ask more the question to the U.S. administration since, uh, as you know, there was the summit in Camp David or organized uh, by, by President Obama. I think it was uh, uh, the American administration, it was a very... Uh, I think a very useful uh, initiative because it's true that we have uh, to give the assurances to the Gulf countries about their security. 
uh, you know, it's, and if they need security assurances, it's not only because of the nuclear deal, uh, but it's because uh, the geopolitical situation uh, I was uh, referring to, uh, <laughs> which has given to, to, to Iran, uh, you know, the, the initiative. Ba basically, we saw it in, in Iraq, and uh, we, we are seeing it also in, in Yemen. So I think the, the message, uh, which, is which was summarized by the, the, the statement after the Camp David summit, uh, Camp David meeting, I think was a very, very useful one. And it's basically also what we, we told our friends from the, the, Gulf, the Gulf countries, uh, that really we, we consider their security requirements are serious and that we want to take uh, really to play, uh, to play a role in it. As you may know, you know we, uh, you know we have opened the French have opened. We have a military basis in the uh, Emirates since 2009. We have security agreements with the states of the region since the 90s. So we have had for a long commitment uh, towards uh, the countries in, in, this, in this region. But frankly, I think their concerns are going well beyond the, the nuclear issue. And in a sense, it's more the uh, what I call the geopolitical situation, which is uh, for us a, a source of concern, especially because they, they, believe, they think that uh, the money, in a sense, that Iran will get if the sanctions are partially or totally lifted could be used by Iran for pursuing uh, its, uh, its adventures uh, in, in their part of the world. So I think they need a particular re reinsurance uh, uh, for, because of that. Uh, Jim Loeb, uh, IPS. Um, given that there uh, is so much concern over recruitment by the Islamic State in, in Europe, and given that Iran is playing probably the leading role in fighting IS, uh, external role that is, uh, in, in Iraq and indirectly in Syria, does, does the IS figure, I, I know the nuclear talks are separate, but at the same time, does it contribute at all to the urgency or eagerness on the part of the <coughs> EU3 with respect to wanting to establish a better relationship with Iran to deal with this question? I'm not sure that I would agree that the Iranians are being that effective. Um, what's happened in Ramadi recently is not a, not a great story for General Soleimani or indeed for anybody else. I think that uh, the Iranians have got their own reasons, of course, for pushing back against ISIL. Uh, it's worth remembering that a decade ago, the Iranians were potentially allies of ours against Al Qaeda, um, partly because our diplomacy did not succeed back in those days. We found ourselves seeing IEDs made in Iran killing American and British soldiers in Afghanistan uh, some years after that. But the reality is that those Sunni extremist groups, it was Al-Qaeda, ISIL, um, whatever you want to call it, uh, there are other fringe groups, they are passionately anti-Shia, anti-Iran, and therefore the Iranians have got their own reasons for fighting back against what they believe to be groups which are dedicated to the destruction of their religion, uh, if not uh, of, their, of their country. But I think it would be wrong to see the commitment that we are all giving to these nego uh, nuclear negotiations as part and parcel of our desire to see ISIL put out of business and stop uh, committing the atrocities that we see on a daily basis. As others have said before, as I was saying earlier, uh, this Iran negotiation is worth doing in its own right. It is specifically linked to the question of stopping Iran getting nuclear weapons and stopping proliferation of weapons of mass destruction in the region. Uh, if we start linking other things, that will not help. It could even, as, as Peter Wittig was saying, uh, spell the end of that negotiation. So we're doing this because it is the right thing to do in its own right and because all the alternatives are worse. Equally, it would be a ver very useful spin-off if as a result of achieving that kind of negotiation, uh, successful negotiation with the Iranians, other aspects of Iranian behavior improved. Uh, and indeed, who knows, if there are common enemies uh, where we are making common cause or could make common cause, you know, that is something to be looked at in the future. But the one is not linked to the other. Okay, lady right here in the middle. Thank you so much. My name is Hannah Morris, and I'm a recent graduate from the School of Foreign Service. 
I wanted to ask about the snapback um, and how this mechanism would exactly work, especially because I can imagine six years down the line, um, some of the sanctions have been lifted. Uh, there is increased business, for example, and Germany is benefiting from it. How, how does the uh, snapback work if we have slight violations uh, that not everyone agrees with is a violation? Will this snapback mechanism be tied to certain behaviors that uh, Iran commits? Uh, I just want to understand okay. what Material this mechanism breach. is looking like. <laughs> Material breach, and how do you define it? Who wants to? We have two ex-UN ambassadors here, but Ambassador Roth, I don't know. Or no, for, we have not. Uh, you know, the, the snapback for the moment, the idea actually is uh, uh, the, the real problem was that we didn't want to, in a sense, to, to give uh, a veto right to some uh, members uh, for, for bringing back the sanctions. So the French have invented uh, a system which is the opposite, uh, which means uh, that actually the, 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 uh, the, the, the sanctions, uh, the step back is automatic, but if there is uh, uh, really uh, a vote in the opposite direction, which, which changes uh, the, uh, the, 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 the veto from one side to the other side, uh, but it has not yet been, been agreed. As for the material breach, by definition, you can't define a material breach, by definition. So it will be, uh, uh, you know, uh, it will be to the first, to the commission, which will be created, as Peter was saying, to discuss, uh, to discuss this issue. And after that, it will be uh, bring back to the, uh, to the level of, uh, of the political level. I, I want, there is something a bit, you know, really, uh, which is a bit getting on my nerves all the time, is this way the Americans are always saying, all oh, the Europeans want to make money, all the Europeans are ready to, to rush to Tehran. You know, really, basically, we, actually, not you, we made the sacrifice of the sanctions. You know, really, we lost a lot of money on, uh, because of the sanctions. Not the Americans, because you were not anymore on the Iranian market. So stop taking the high moral ground saying, you know, it's, well, I know it's very American, but really on this issue, we, the, we the Europeans, we have no lesson to receive from anybody. We have done a very tough job. We, we have done it in a very loyal, uh, loyal way. So uh, there is, you know, really, and again, uh, European businessmen are not more greedy than the Americans ones, and not less, by the way. Uh, so uh, if, the America, if the Iranians are going to not to abide by their commitments, the Europeans will be very strong, very keen, and will work with uh, the other members of the P5 to, to, to reimpose the sanctions. And again, we are trying to, to fix, to have a mechanism which allows us to do it as quickly and as effectively as it's possible. We have not yet reached an agreement. Again, it's very technical. There are very different elements uh, uh, for, for an agreement. I'm a little confused still. I mean, France is always against automaticité. Exactly. And so how can you have snapback be automatic? No, uh, what we, we, in a sense, let's be frank, what we want, we want to try is to try to avoid, what we want to avoid is to avoid basically the Russians and the Chinese saying we are against it, so we don't, uh, you know, really. So uh, that's what we want. So we want a, a, a system, uh, uh, you know, a system which will be, uh, which will be the, the opposite. In a sense, you know, it will, it will be to, it will be reinstated automatically, you know, really. But if the five, the P5, you know, uh, uh, agree not to. So really, it's, it's, it's a mechanism which is uh, uh, really, uh, which is not submitted to the veto of our friends, of so our you, colleagues. So it's a majority rule then, three will, against two? Exactly, or, yeah. Okay, but as opposed to giving them their veto. Of course, P5 and Germany, you know, really. <laughs> but Which makes I, it four to well, two. Well, no, 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 the problem, no, it's we're P5. In, because in the Security five, Council, five, there is no Germany. But it's like the we are speaking of the, P, of the oh, Security P, P5, Council. Oh, P5, not P5 plus one, just It's P5 the Security here. Council. Yeah, we are speaking of the Security Council resolution, uh, uh, sanctions. Because the U.S. sanctions, you know, the U.S. may 
reimpose them without asking anybody uh, with the way, same way the EU may do it. Yeah. Well, I, I would say in the EU, yeah. we can organize well, exactly. the snapback very easily. Okay. easily. Okay. Yeah, that's in, the, in the UN context, yeah. where, where, where you guys yeah. have, have, have the last yeah. word, it's more difficult. Yeah. Okay, good, good point. Uh, let's see, the lady right here in the middle. Hello, I'm Sharon Bovat, Voice of a Moderate. Quick question. Um, when I was here before for a panel, I think Barbara Slavin was on it, she was saying that 70% of the Ar Iranian people wanted a peace deal, but then the person that did that poll ended up in jail. I think that was at a panel. 70% of Iranians wanted a normal relationship with the US. That was way before the nuclear Exactly, talks. but Back now we've got the nuclear deal and the American mindset is being a little bit more open-minded, maybe because of ISIS, I don't know. And I'm wondering with you, with each of your countries, what are your average people, like an average American, for the first time their mind is open that peace could be possible maybe it's Cuba but what about you and your countries thank you I would think this diplomacy is pretty popular throughout or not what are the I think uh, <laughs> all of our countries all of our governments have got their own bits of baggage uh, in in that part of the world uh, sometimes <laughs> with Iran sometimes with Turkey sometimes with different countries where we have a history or we don't have a history I think if you take the case of Iran, of course, public opinion in this country has been seared by the experience of the hostages blindfolded for 444 days. Uh, that was an, an appalling moment. Uh, in the case of the United Kingdom, uh, public opinion was appalled. When only a couple of years ago, uh, a, a bunch of government-backed thugs broke into our embassy, trashed the place, uh, destroyed it, made a filthy mess, and so on. Um, Iranians have got their own memories, some, some accurate, some not, of what foreign powers have done to their sovereignty over the last one, two, three hundred years. We've all got a degree of baggage, but I, I would say in the case of uh, the United Kingdom, uh, our public opinion is not uh, at a stage of being um, deeply worried about the concept of a normalized relationship with Iran. We go back a very long way. Um, others have talked about the historic links of their own companies. The, the Iran oil industry was actually set up by British companies, so we've got a, you know, deep roots in that sector, and we have had our own political and business links, and even political links. The United Kingdom was the dominant power in the Persian Gulf for a very, very long time. So we go back a long way with all the countries in that region, and I think public opinion, um, if asked to support uh, the kind of deal that our governments are determined to negotiate, and though it's a good deal, not a bad deal, will not have a problem about the normalization of relations with Iran. However, that said, I, I would say that I think all of us, whether it's governments or whether it is uh, public citizens, will want to be seeing Iran behaving in different ways in the years to come thereafter. As I say, the two are not linked, but Iranian bad behavior in other respects, it might be human rights, it might be regional destabilization, it might be support of terrorist groups. You know, we will be looking for progress in those areas as well. Okay, uh, gentleman right there. Will Satran, I'm a fellow with the Plowshares Fund. Um, so my question is in regards to the potential uh, arms race in the Middle East, which uh, Ambassador Wittig briefly talked upon. Um, so Saudi Arabia has famously said uh, after the framework agreement that anything Iran had that they wanted to have too. Um, now that inherently seems to me like an opportunity, not a negative thing. Um, if, this, if the deal shapes up and uh, gives us confidence that Iran will never develop a nuclear weapon, why shouldn't we say, Saudi Arabia, you're more than welcome to sign on to this. Why not use it as a model for uh, arms control in the Middle East? I think, uh, again, uh, on the opposite for me, it's the, in a sense the most worrying aspect of the agreement, that we have created a sort of new status of the one-year breakout mm -hmm. uh, state. You know, in the NPT, we had so far only the, um, the non-weapon states and the weapon states, and now we have a one-year breakout time state. It's a new status, you know, really. Uh, so, um, so when you make a negotiation, you have always to think of several elements, and one is which precedent are you setting for, for, the, for the other countries. And here, um, I think it was emphasized by Henry Kissinger uh, in a hearing uh, uh, in the Senate, the U.S. Senate, and, and, and I think that's, that's one of the concerns 
that we will have to address after the agreement that you don't have uh, not only uh, Saudi Arabia and not only in this part of the world, simply countries <coughs> rushing to become one-year breakout st uh, states. You know, and we couldn't object, saying, oh, they said, oh, Iran got it, and, uh, uh, and again, it's not civilian, uh, so why not us? So that's, that's actually it's the opposite. For me, it's, I, I should say that it's, in a sense, one of the major weak points of the agreements that we are negotiating. Because let's be frank, the, the agreement is not perfect. It's a compromise. Any agreement is a compromise. So it's not a perfect agreement that France would have wanted. Uh, uh, but I think it's the same thing for, for, I guess, Germany and UK. It's what is possible. And I think what we reached is what was uh, possible. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't have some consequences that we will have to address. Of course, I think the questioner also meant the verification measures, mm. though, would be included. So it's not just a question of one-year breakout, but they would have to accept additional protocol mm. and, uh, and all of the other transparency yeah. measures that are yeah. going to be uh, put on Iran. But nevertheless, even with verification system, to have a one-year breakout state, I guess, is not positive for the future, <laughs> for the future of the proliferation system. Any comments? That's true, but let's not forget the NPT envisions the right of countries to enrich for civilian purposes. So that's something that all the states have uh, that are members of the NPT. And I might add, um, we are the only country in that uh, five uh, plus one configuration that is a non-nuclear country. And so we know uh, what obligations uh, come with it and what rights. And, and that uh, yeah. might, might also have contributed um, to show the Iranians that we're not imposing, uh, mm -hmm. so that the, the five nuclear countries are not imposing something on them that uh, uh, it deprives them of, mm -hmm. of, of rights that others have. So I think um, the, the question of whether there will be a nuclear arms race hinges very much upon uh, the, the kind of verification regime and how that is designed and how this works in practice. If we can create a real intrusive, credible, viable inspection and verification regime, um, that would, uh, I think, uh, take away a lot of grounds for engaging in an arms race. And if we get to that point, then hopefully the other governments in the region will not be looking for exact parity. You know, they can have a nuclear program with only a year's breakout over a period of a decade or so. Um, it should be about whether they have confidence that Iran is not going to have nuclear weapons. If that is the case, then there's no reason why others in the region who have been talking about the possibility of buying one off the shelf uh, if uh, the Iranians end up having nuclear weapons, there's no reason why they should do that. Uh, the, the arrangements we've reached uh, with Iran, we are negotiating with Iran, uh, take account of the existing reality of where the Iran civil nuclear program has got to. Um, they would be starting from scratch. Why would you do that unless you felt genuinely threatened? This is not about they've got it, we've got to have it for the sake of that. It's not in Iran's interest. It's not in anyone else's interest. And it's not in the interest of, of regional stability. So I think <laughs> we have to make sure that there's a proper regime with verification, as my colleagues were saying. But the Iranians also have an interest in showing that they are serious about implementing their side of the deal if they want to create the regional stability which will discourage others from seeing, oh my god, I don't have sufficient confidence that this thing's going to work. We better reinsure as well. So so I think everyone has got a responsibility to this. It doesn't need to be about parity equal equal. It does have to be about confidence that we're not going to have more nuclear weapons in the region. I would add that there are other countries that already are at the one year or even less breakout if we look at a Japan, for example, countries that could make nuclear weapons but choose not to. So it may not be an entirely new category uh, in, in that sense. Um, yeah. um, I'm more worried about Middle East than Japan. I, I would agree with you on that. <laughs> um, I don't have a watch on, so how are we on time? Yeah, time's up.